one. Welcome to the Light Forge. This is Abukta. Hey guys, this is Murps, and today we have an awesome guest here, Shady. Uh, Shady, why don't you talk a little bit about yourself? Hey guys, uh, very happy to be here. So you said, uh, Shady Bunny, Infinite Arena player, uh, like to play the game, love to play the game, stream almost seven days a week, uh, have a day out here or there. Uh, yeah, just great to be here. Yeah, Shady, uh, you missed the most important part. You missed the epic, epic right, stream right. we had earlier this week. <laughs> ah, yes, of course, of course. Where we went tw uh, 12 wins twice. And Shady, it seems like, because we've had you on our stream quite a few times, and it seems as though every time you come on, we either have fun, win a lot, or do both. A lot of times it's both. Yeah, it's the best combination, of course, if you're having fun. <laughs> uh, you do better, right, when you're having fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, but we're glad to have you on, and uh, we want to talk to you about a lot of things today. Uh, yeah, so like if you if you don't know Shady, and you might not if you're listening to this, uh, he's like I, I wouldn't say he's uh, unknown, but he's probably the best like lesser known arena player that we have come across after our you know many many uh, co-ops with uh, with many many streamers and uh, and non-streamers alike. And he's, he's getting a little bigger now on Twitch, uh, but this is just a great opportunity, I think, for us to kind of profile what we would consider like a rising star in the arena community as far as uh, things goes. And Merpsel, you can take this from here. What's, um, uh, I think Shady has a, a record right now in TGT of like 7.89? Like yeah. yeah, so Shady, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna embarrass you here. But <laughs> okay. Shady has a ridiculous record of 202 total runs and his average is 7.91. Let's let that sink in for a second. That is ridiculous, guys, 7.91. Uh, Shady, how do you feel about this? Uh, yeah, it's it's very uh, fun. Uh, every, everything's starting to pay off, you know, always <laughs> being methodical, always being like, all right, let's think this through, let's do the ordering and stuff. And you know, all the little pieces, they fall together and they like, it starts showing. So that's really great. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about your uh, great record. We're going to break it down a little bit, talk about your best classes, worst classes. But before we do that, Shady, just give us a bit of an introduction. Like, how did you even get into hearthstone wizard poker and how'd you get so good at it hi right, um originally i uh played a, a like a very tiny bit of hearthstone when uh open beta started it's like a really tiny bit uh so it was kind of fun but i was streaming league of legends at the time uh, mm -hmm. but then i got my injury in my wrist uh, rsi so i couldn't continue streaming league of legends and a buddy of mine said hey why don't we just do some co-ops in Hearthstone Arena, I can click, you know, uh, I used to play a bunch of card games back in the day. So it was like, all right, sure, it'll be fun. And we we're like, you know, in for doing that three weeks, maybe. And we we're just hitting ridiculous numbers. We we're like, wow, that's another 12, another 12. We're like, what's, <laughs> let's, let's stream this, you know, and then me and my buddy were streaming with like 10, 20 viewers. We're like, oh, it was a lot of fun, like very, uh, very small community. Um, yeah, and, and just how, how I got so good at it, um, I have uh, card game experience. Uh, I was uh, actually, when I was uh, 15 years old, I was the national champion of Belgium in Yu-Gi-Oh! I don't know if you guys ever heard of that, but it's a card game. Uh, and when I was smaller, I also competed in the nationals playing Pokemon uh, card game. Then I played Magic when I was older, so I've always had fairly decent experience with card games. So the transition into Hearthstone, it wasn't that difficult. Yeah, that actually explains a lot because uh, Shady, we were talking previously and you said you didn't really start playing seriously until GBG. So in my head, I was wondering, how did you get this good this fast? <laughs> yeah, the, the time that I spoke about with my buddy doing the co-ops, that was GBG when GBG just hit. Wow. I see. Um, so what, uh, I had no idea about your Yu-Gi-Oh experience, about your Pokemon experience. So first of all, we can talk about Pokemon uh, until the sun sets, but we, we won't do that <laughs> oh, for God. the sake of this Murps, podcast. Murps and his Pokemon collection. Pokemon. This is right. fabled. <laughs> but um, so w what specifically from those games uh, translated so well into Hearthstone? Well, the main thing uh, was card advantage because tempo was actually a fa like, okay, guys, this is going to shock you. But at the start of the game, my buddy actually had to say, 
we have to go face now. I was like, what? No, cards, <laughs> cards. Not so. But I, I adapted very quickly. And then I realized like, oh, oh okay. So car- I actually realized, okay, cards mostly don't matter in this game. In GVG, at least, it was super aggressive. And I was like, as long as I've got boards, I'll just kill the guy before cards stop mattering. But at the very start, it was mostly those card advantage te- uh, tactics. Um, and yeah, just using your mana efficiently, uh, being methodical, think, you know, especially in magic, got to be very methodical, you know, like, all right, we do first this phase, then this phase and this phase. And so, so those things, good, good basics, I'd say, very good basics. Nice, nice. So my second part of that question was you becoming an infinite arena player. It seems like you had an accelerated track. You got there faster than most players. Was it just playing? Was it doing the co-ops? Um, I know you coach as well, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but how did you make that leap from just playing this game into the infinite arena player that you are now? Actually, becoming infinite, that was actually very fast. I, I think maybe, I'm, I'm going to say a month. I'm, I'm going to say it's around that period of time. Wow. It's just I, I had a lot of time. And as I said, I just <laughs> like I, I used to do like magic drafts all the time. So that was my preferred format. So mm-hmm. limited. So it's just like draft, 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 draft. So on Magic Online, uh, I wasn't infinite on Magic Online. I hadn't done that too much, but Magic Online is really cutthroat to be infinite, like seriously difficult. Um, so I, I had that that um, that experience of like, OK, so you buy yourself in then you try to survive as long as possible and then I just always seem to find the the most um, simple way to get there. It might not be the perfect way, but I just realized, okay, so as long as I build a deck that can go seven, it's fine. So I tried to stay away from like, oh, let's build the perfect deck. I was like, okay, so I just need curve. If I build curve, I can go infinite, right? So the quality, the quality mm-hmm. of the cards is not that important. So that's how I started to go infinite. Curve, 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 curve. And then obviously later on you start to get those fine tuning to right here i have to pick the value card so you can squeeze a little bit more out of the deck but that was that was basically it just uh realizing if my curve is great i'm probably going to go infinite yeah i think that's a really good observation and especially when you played a lot in gvg i, I thought that based on my observation that was kind of the most important lesson to take from gvg just curving out well and uh which really was a difference from previous expansions. So you picking up that major lesson and getting to infinite, I, I think just really shows how important that is for GVG and it's still important for today's meta, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Definitely. All right, so I think we've uh, kind of been beating around the bush uh, for a while, but let's just... <laughs> let's, okay, let's tackle, oh, what's uh, happening now? No, let's just tackle your record head on. And right. let's, oh, let's talk yeah. About this. Um, so... 7.91 is ridiculous. The weird thing while examining your record is your number one class, it's not Paladin, it's not Mage, it's not Rogue, which I know you love so much. Rogue is number two, it's Druid. And Druid. I, yeah, with 8.78 <laughs> out of 27 runs. So that's pretty significant. Um, explain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Druid, believe it or not, was my worst class below Warrior in GVG um, because it didn't do aggro very well. Warrior was pretty good at aggro, you know, draft the uh, Arcanine Reapers, go face, you know, kill the guy. But now we've got Living Roots, we've got the, uh, you know, another Knight on the Prowl. Ah, I do the Battle Cries, uh, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? The three, Druid of the Saber. Yeah. Right. Druid of the Saber, there we go. Um, uh, <laughs> Not Power a Battle of the Cry. Wild. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, uh, Power of the Wild is great with Living Roots. Uh, Savage Roar is great with it. Mukla's Champion is amazing in Druid. You know, it just spread out, uh, buff everything. So uh, my plan with Druid is to just go full on aggro, have those three one drops, maybe even more. Uh, use AOE buffing as much as you can. Mukla's Champion, Storm Champion, Power of the Wild, Savage Roar. Uh, draft a little bit of Reach. Uh, Druid of the Claws, uh, usually charged <laughs> with me, uh, Swipe, Starfire, and then if that all fails, you put an Iron Bark in his face and you still win, right? Because it's like, <laughs> you're like, oh, I've defended this endless onslaught of charge and stuff, and they're like, boom, 8-8 taunt. And they're like, wow, I can't get around that, and then you still win. So 
I feel like you are very safe in going so aggressive because you're, yeah, you know, Inspire like Muklas will keep you going. Uh, maybe a little bit of card draw here and there. Cult Master works wonders in any aggro deck. And then just being able to draft maybe three endgame minions. You know, my last 12 through it had uh, your Mongar, an Ancient of War, and an Iron Bark. That's it. All the rest was like uh, five uh, mana or lower. And then you just you curve out with those big guys and they can't stop you. Yeah, I think that's interesting. So you're drafting, like, pointedly, you're purposely drafting a very uh, fast Druid deck, and mm -hmm. you're not shy about taking an Iron Bark, about taking a Dromongar, and a few, like, incredibly large late-game minions, not even, like, five or six drops, but beyond that, to kind of anchor yeah. your, your late-game. Um, yeah. So can you, like, talk a little bit more about uh, about that kind of strategy? Uh, well, being an aggro deck meaning uh, means that you will have an advantage on other decks is meaning you will never really be short of mana <laughs> because you've used most of your cards early game. Mm -hmm. So when you do draw that card in the late game, you know, that's that's it's a very important slot in your deck. You know, it's a precious slot. So you don't want to waste that on a Lord of the Arena. You want to be like, all right, if I do go into the late game and I reach 10 mana or whatever, I want to play something that really, really matters because my win condition isn't to just sit back and curve out and get a you know get a decent six drop or whatever you want to get like that really powerful minion that will actually do a lot for you so i have decks that perfectly curve out and they're just like regular druid decks because i'm, I'm not just an aggro player it's my preferred mm -hmm. drafting style i also recognize when the draft says all right not this one and i'm like okay cool we just yeah. play curve it's fine we'll we'll draft two boulder fist ogres uh for stank uh, some swipes some wrath early on that's, by the way, with the indicator when I go like, okay, I'm getting a lot of early removal. I'm probably better to play something that goes more for the late game. So, it's, uh, but yeah, that's a basic strategy there. You want to yeah. make those slots really matter. I think that's a really good strategy and kind of, so there's two roles that the Iron Bark Protector, and I'm just using that as kind of a, a big drop. You, you can say Ancient of War or anything big. Mm -hmm. um, there's two roles that you can use with that. And kind of the role that you use is that's the closer. Um, it seems that you use the Iron Bark Protector, you know, you kind of tempo out, you curve out, and that at the end, when you're potentially kind of uh, running out, you just drop this beefy 8A and close out the game with it, which is a much better use for the Iron Bark than its potential other use, which is kind of trying to retake the board. You drop this, you know, you're a little bit behind, they have three minions, and you're just crossing your fingers and saying, yeah. no silence, no polymorph, no removal, and just kind of praying that they bump all three minions into it, which is just a very risky strategy. But you, because you're able to dictate with your minions, you drop the Iron Bark, and then it's kind of like, well, you need AOE and a removal, deal with my board, and you usually just win because you're able to drop that at the end. Yep, exactly. Um, and like I said, it's not always that you can draft a deck like that, but most of the time, because you don't have these key cards uh, that you need per se. You know, you just need good curve, decent minion quality. It's not like with a with a mage deck, you're like, all right, I can only pull this off if I have a blizzard and a flame strike. It's not that kind of strategy. Yeah. So Shady, do you think you do something different with druids and other players? Because with most players, their top uh, their top class is going to be mage, paladin, rogue. Um, do, do you think you play it in a way that some people haven't figured out yet? Um, tell us your secret. Uh, <laughs> go face. No, uh, it's uh, lots of lots of fun works. Like I said, I'm very comfortable. Like Arjun Squire, I know you guys are big on the Squire. Uh, I'm, I'm very big on the Squire in Druids because it's so good because uh, the Divine Shield like, kind of amplifies the buffs you can put on her. So putting a Power of the Wild on an Arjun Squire, very good. Suddenly, it's like a really good one drop. That's a shielded mini bot all of a sudden. So I uh, really prefer to have those uh, three one drops. And just, yeah, be aggressive. Don't be afraid to go away from the, the classic druid style, you know, that people thought is just like, all right, so just play a bunch of taunts and then, you know, let him smack into your taunts. He runs out of stuff and then we win, right? Uh, go go face. I've, I've started to go face a lot more as well. Uh, I always ask myself, like, okay, what's, what's the exact punish here? Which card does he need to make this trade bad? And I'll still make trades that are too risky, you know, like, You've got three, four health minions. Your, your mage opponent is on turn six right now, and he's got two dudes. All right, I'll, I'll trade in, I'll keep one alive, and I'll mm -hmm. reinforce. But if that's turn six, I'm not going to play around the blizzard there. I mean, that's going face. And then suddenly, you know, you get Lummer out, you have your Druid of the Claw as charge, you get your swipe that can do extra damage. 
Living Roots can also go face Savage Roar. Uh, I really like to have one Roar. So there's just, I've had to turn five lethals as well, where you just go like, all right, uh, turn one, Living Roots, turn two, play a two drop, turn three, play a one drop, and Power of the Wild, everything. So you're like, all right, that's my board, deal with it. And oftentimes they can't. So yeah, just, uh, yeah it gets really rewarded. And the downside is almost nothing for playing so aggressive. Yeah, I think the Druid, like the whole class has really shifted in, in this direction. Uh, I think Druid has always been like one of my top like three or four classes, uh, never my number one class. Uh, but it, it, and I've always played Druid in a more aggressive fashion than most people play Druid. I think the last person that I ever knew who said like, yeah, Druid's my top class right now was like Trump in Classic. Um, and that was very value oriented the way he played, obviously. So you can see how far along the Druid has come. Then now we're talking to, uh, you know, the you know, pro uh, infinite player who is rocking eight and however many wins per run with Druid. And he's like, yeah, go face. Go face as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. Like, set it up. You know, he can't do anything about it. That's how Druid is, uh, is going to get you success. It has really gone uh, a lot in uh, into that direction with the new cards and the offering rates for TGT. And I think... So I have not had a very good experience with Druid. In my mind, I know it's a great class. And uh, before, in BRM, my Druid was like almost 8 wins per run. It was like more than 7.5. But then in uh, TGT, it has dropped. I don't know if it's like a mix of bad decks or bad luck. I have a small sample size compared to you, of course. Um, but I think it's also because I haven't... I haven't adjusted my play when I'm playing or drafting Druid to be even more aggro than what I was comfortable with because I was more tempo oriented than value oriented with the Druid earlier. And now I'm thinking, oh yeah, that's still going to work. The whole meta shifted to be more value oriented. So if I just stay the same as the Druid, I should be fine. And it yeah. seems like what you're suggesting is like because of your card pool and what you're being offered and how all these things work together, you will actually want to go even farther to uh, to the aggro, like anchor with big cards, but to yeah. not try to play like, you know, slightly faster mid range, but instead to actually try to play aggro, aggro control, uh, set up the board. Yeah, that, that might be a trap though, because as you said, if you just do it the way you said it, you'll be fine. That's the trick. Like that's mm -hmm. that's why people probably aren't doing it this way. It's yeah. because like, hey, don't don't fix it uh, if it's not broken. Yeah. And uh, it's it's fine. You can play the way we've always been playing through it. Yeah. I'm just you know approach it from a different angle and just get yeah. Even, but even like you know you know me, shady. I don't like it when things are fine. I want yeah, things to be I, like as good I, as possible. I, I and so every opponent <laughs> is a warlock. I mean, <laughs> very well, man. <laughs> That's the mentality I have to have. Yeah, it really struck me when you said, yeah, like I'm almost always charging out my Druid of the Claws. Like I thought I was aggressive with Druid of the Claws and I charge them out maybe half the time. And I think most people like rarely charge them out. Uh, something with Druid of the Claw charge as well is that some people, they they take too much of a risk by putting it in Taunt. If you put it in, let's say you have the option of killing off a, uh, let's say a two and four to be mm -hmm. fairly conservative. Your opponent's got two and four. You can either taunt up your Druid of the Claw, or you can take the freebie, just charge it out, kill the 2-4, have a 4-2 left, that 4-2 will probably just deal 4 damage to the other minion and then die, which it probably would have done anyway in the taunt form. Yeah. But you're no longer susceptible to buffs going onto that 2-4, say a PO. You're no longer susceptible to an assassinate hitting that taunt. You're no longer susceptible to whatever, right? Um, so. Sometimes I'm like, okay, it's good enough to cash it in now. I'll just charge it and take out his dude. And then, especially against rogues, you'll beat him like, ah, I was going to sap that. Damn, that's annoying, right? So yeah. it's, it's also some mentality. And of course, for being aggressive, you can also just go face with him. Mm -hmm. Just a little something uh, to try in between. Like, it's sometimes safer to charge them than to put it as a liability on the board. Yeah, definitely agree. And we've been talking... In our conversation with Druid, we've touched upon all of these other top classes as well. And I think that's a good transition to looking down on your, your list uh, of your different classes. Um, Druid obviously sticks out because it's number one. But I think the most surprising thing, Shady, is oh my God. Paladin. Yeah, Your yeah. Paladin is number six out of nine classes. And it is neck and neck with the number seventh class, which is Warlock. Like if you had another Paladin run and it just didn't do so well, it would be number seven. So 
explain that to me. Like, I, I, I can't even comprehend this um, because Paladin everyone has no reach, man. <laughs> bad, class. <laughs> bad class. No, I don't know, guys. Um, I mean, I, it's true, though. It's true. You look at it. Paladin's reach is one of the least of all the classes. And same with Warlock. And, you know, your, your two classes below that are Warrior and, and Priest, obviously. Because uh, I think yeah. that's most people's lower classes. Yeah. And they have even less reach. Wow, Warrior is just bad. But Priest has definitely less reach. Anyway, go on, sorry. No, no. To, uh, well, the joke aside, of course, uh, I do find myself way too often in a position. So that, that's a point where I'm like, hmm, maybe I'm not dynamic enough. Uh, I'm, I'm fa like, I can do it with Mage. Uh, most of my mage games are not aggressive at all. I do this whole attrition thing where I'm like, all right, let's mm -hmm. draft Capture Drill Mongar and Ping and Frostbolt or early things and just have more stuff than them. But with Paladin, way too many times, I find myself trying to push for lethal where I'm like, well, well my earlier run today, I had an 11 win Paladin and I could go aggressive with that. And that's why it went 11 wins. It had like one Seal of Champions, one Consecrate and just good curve. Mm -hmm. like, all right, good curve. I can tempo out. I can be aggressive. I find myself trying to do that too much. So... I think the main problem that I have with Paladin is that probably even in a draft, I'm not looking for this whole Paladin style. I'm like, I'm probably not. I mean, it's not a terrible stat. I think it was still, you know, seven plus something. But yeah, we should be able to do eight plus with that if I can mm -hmm. do eight plus with the Druid. So I think it's just a whole mentality change that I still need to get with Paladin because I didn't play Paladin in GVG because like, all right, everybody's playing Paladin. Everybody's playing Mage. I didn't play Mage and Paladin in GVG. Decided wait, to play wait, so now you decided to play Paladin? Now that no one is playing Paladin? <laughs> I know, but it was like, all right, I, 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 I kind of timed him out an entire uh, expansion. So I was like, all right, we'll try it now. Um, originally, I thought Murloc Knight was going to be fun. I was like, hey, but now I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, no, I think that's the main thing. Just from drafting to playing it, just trying to just set up and hang in there. I think today I had kind of an epiphany where I'm like, all right, so all I have to do is just keep playing stuff. And at some point, they can't deal with it. And then I buff. Okay, cool. Nice. But I, I usually don't play like it. I'm way more proactive. Uh, with Paladin, kind of just got to play it, see if they respond. And then, ah, you didn't respond. Okay, now I win the game because my minion is going to kill your minion for free. So, Yeah. So, Adwokta, we talked about this. When we analyzed Shady stats, we kind of thought the Paladin was weird. And then we kind of got into this conversation about our Paladin kind of, it's not performing that well either, right? <laughs> nope. Uh, I mean, we've realized that from kind of the beginning, right? Like, uh, we've never been as high on Paladin as I think a lot of other people. Um, and I just want to point out that we're just looking at Shady stats, like, you know, judging him as we judge, like, all, like, cards and everything. We made, like, a system and a tier list to judge all the cards. Then we judge classes. Now we're judging players. We're just very <laughs> judgmental people, Murps. Yes, we definitely are. <laughs> And we're, we we are judging a person, and now we're gonna keep on judging this paladin class. So yeah, um, okay. So getting back to your question about the paladin, uh, like we said this before, right? Uh, which is that I, like I remember the biggest uh, like difference that we had back when uh, when Hafu was on last month was that she thought paladin was the best class, and then we thought rogue was the best class, and she saw the power, and we saw the like flexibility and the kind of higher skill cap for the rogue, um, and. It was just, I, I think we never quite believed in the hype surrounding the Paladin on TGT because Murloc Knight is still RNG. That yeah. will hold you back to a certain extent, right? That's one of the problems mm -hmm. with uh, Fire Guard Destroyer, right? Like anything that you tinge with RNG is just not going to be as great for better players. And more than that, Paladin's always reactive. It has the best reactive cards, and they can leave it anything on the board, you're screwed, like Priest almost, but like it's even more flexible than Priest with the hero power. But it's still reactive. You will enter turn 6 if you don't play a shield and mini bot, or you don't get that Arjun uh, Protector combo out, which are both more rare now with TGT, both because of dilution and because TGT cards are at plus 25%. Uh, you just, you don't have the board. You have the yeah. least ways to have the board getting into, uh, to like, besides Priest, right? You have the least ways of having the board getting into turn four. And so playing from behind is a skill, but it's also putting you into just, like, a, a higher percent chance that you're going to definitely lose no matter what you do. And, sure. and that hurts when you're a good player. Like, when you're trying to get seven wins, that's probably even okay. When you're trying to get six wins, that's uh, it's a very good, like, ratio to have. But if you're trying to push that class to eight wins... It's going to be more of an uphill climb than when you have a more flexible class like a mage or like a, especially like a rogue. 
Yeah, I, I think you're very right there. I think the reason why we see so many paladins in the arena is because, let's be honest, it's easy. If mm -hmm. you get something to stick, you slap a buff on it, you kill the opponent's minion, and you're so far ahead that you're probably going to win. But um, then you do get into that higher win bracket, and you have those players who won't allow you to do that. So obviously, mm -hmm. Paladin can be the most demoralizing thing to play against if they do go mini bot into muster. I mean, most every games time that turn happen, three like, muster yeah. happens every time. Yeah. I don't know how <laughs> that cannot possibly be statistically right. Just in in my mind, it's like, all right, if I win for if I'm I'm not favorite. Like the moment that muster, mm -hmm. like even if it's not set up by a mini bot, the moment that muster for battle hits the board, in my mind it goes like. I'm fighting an uphill battle from this moment on. He gets so much stuff, it musters ridiculous. But then when you don't have the card, which is going to happen quite a bit, because it's a rare, um, it, the class just doesn't seem to work that well. So I think the reason why we feel that Paladin is so good is because we play against it all the time. Mm -hmm. And there's so many Paladins around that the guys up in the higher brackets, they will have those cards consistently. Yeah. So yeah. the, the guys that don't have it, they get filtered out early. You don't meet mm -hmm. them or you meet one or two and go like, ah, oh, nice, good win. And then there's just the guys that have it because they've beaten other paladins that didn't have it. And you go like, what? This guy had muster into kings. I can't win, right? Minibot, king, king, uh, minibot muster, kings. It's perfect sequence. Minibot grabs the board, muster keeps the board and has something on the board. And then king solidifies the win with a 5-5 five, five charge, as you will, right? 5-5 five, five mm -hmm. charge, minion, the, the recruit. So I think that's the main thing that we have, where we like, all right, the class is insane, but not if you don't have those early game cards. So I think now we are starting to understand that that okay, in terms of consistency, it's not the it's not the greatest class. Yeah, yeah. and I know a lot of people would think that is ludicrous, that's heresy, but that's uh, <laughs> you know. consistently said it, and now uh, and now here's more proof. Yeah. yeah. So shady, I want to turn this to a slightly different topic, but something that I think you're very familiar with. If anyone watches your stream, they'll see that you have coach and you still do coach quite a lot of players. And I think of varying skill levels, you just open up your coaching to basically um, a lot of people who watch your stream. So I really wanna pick your brain about coaching as someone who coaches a lot. Um, out of this, like everyone that you coach, kind of what do you think is the number one thing holding players back from becoming infinite? The number one thing that holds people like, well, I'll name a few and then we can decide what would be the number one, right? Sure. Uh, a, a, re a really big one is that people do not take time when they're going over their turn. Uh, everybody has their first play, right? Everybody sees a play. Now, really good players, they will be like, all right, well, let's put that on hold. That's the default play. If I start to rope, I'll go with that one. What else can I do here? Oh, I could do this. Oh, or well, in two turns, he could be play a Dread Inferno. Maybe I want to get rid of these one ones here. Okay, let's do it like this. You know, you go very in depth. Uh, so I rope a lot, which is funny because I'm a really aggressive player, but I rope a lot because I like to plan everything out, be really meticulous. And most people that I coach, like in the first and seconds, go like, all right, we do this. All right, we do that. I'm like, well, take your time. Take your time. Got, got the entire turn. Let's plan things out. So that's a really big thing. That's a really big one. Uh, take your time to analyze the turn. Um, yeah, another one would probably be in the draft. Know what your class wants to do. Know which different archetypes there are in the class, and know where you're headed. And then mm -hmm. you can go from there. Because people are like, "All right, how do you draft?" Well, I pick the best card every time. Like, well, that's not how you. Well, first of all, there's curve and stuff. But then, even people that pay attention to the curve, still they have difficulty deciding. Like, hmm. Is this the deck where Jeeves is really good or really bad? Most people are ask, oh, Jeeves, Jeeves is bad, period, right? Yeah. But then you have this deck that curves out at four and Jeeves becomes <laughs> a god, right? It's like, whoa, yeah. Jeeves is great, right? So it's those little things. So drafting, knowing what you want and how you're going to get there. And then during the plays themselves, being aware of all the plays that you could make and that your opponent could make. Those are two, those are two really big things. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it really comes through. We did the co-op uh, on Thursday, as we like to do with uh, with uh, some of our Light Forge guests, um, and we just we went two twelve win runs, and throughout the entire time we're doing it, there's there are times where I thought it was really obvious that there was like one play, and then Shady would be like, "Wait, hold on, 
what if we do this other thing? Just hold on while I'm thinking it through. And in my mind, I'm like, that can't possibly be the play. And then he goes through it, and he's like, okay, if we do this, then he has at this much light, this happens, this happens. Uh, okay, yeah, that's not the best play. Go with the original play. But you really do, like, very much slow it down and look through everything. And uh, and that that is going to help because there was at least one time in that run, if not two times, where we, you know, after you told us to, like, kind of step back a little, and we're like, oh, yeah, like, that's... That's actually the better uh, the better play, as it turns out, because of these whatever considerations that weren't very apparent at the time at first glance. And so it, it is definitely helpful, even at like our level of you know where we a lot of things are pretty intuitive now, and we like kind of slow down more to explain things than that we would actually normally slow down. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it was it did make a, a you know difference in the play that we ended up going with a, a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah. even when oh sorry, even when those times where we. Uh, didn't change the original play and i think that happened the majority of the time it always added something into our perspective it Mm -hmm. like got me thinking about exactly what needs to happen for us to reach lethal it got me thinking of um exactly what can we expect from the other player and it just puts you in this better mindset and it's easy to get tunnel vision it's easy to miss something and i think shady this definitely comes from your coaching experience you just like take a group of people and say let's take a few seconds, step back, and like, let's analyze the entire situation for a second. And I think it'll just help our collective mindset. And it really did. I think it definitely contributed to our 12 wins. Yeah, for sure. It's it's something that I have to tell myself, you know, and, and I'm not above it. Sometimes I have these runs where, all right, let's do that. I'm, a, I'm, I'm Shady Bunny. I know how to play this game. And, like, and then they go like three turns later, you're like, well, if I had thought a little bit longer there, I would have done this and I wouldn't be in this position right now. And you, you know, your mind, maybe you're like, you're trying to wave it away, but then you're like, no, I, no, no, I, I messed it up. I messed it up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you step it up again. So it's it's something that you're always going to need to practice, but it, it can become a habit. Um, at first, I think people might be a little bit scared of doing it because like, oh, I'm playing this game. It's fun. I don't want to like like be too logical and like have this like, entire checklist <laughs> that I want to do every time. I just want to have some fun. But you get used to it very fast. Just the first thing every time it's like, what are all the plays? It's the first yeah. question I ask myself every single turn. What are all the plays? And I'm like, all right, let's go over them. Yeah. But logic is fun, Shady. Logic, yeah. We, we think <laughs> logic is a lot of fun. But yeah, there's a lot of people that play the game uh, and just go like, all right, let's just do something and see what happens, right? It's just like, let's throw this rock into the river and see, see what mm-hmm. ripples it makes. I think that's how a lot of people approach the game. Like, all right, let's slap this on the board, see what he does, right? Mm-hmm. I don't have to think about it too much, let him handle it, and yeah. It's... Those players are called paladin players. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, funny, uh, in the arena, the, uh, the, the constructed hunters are the arena paladins, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but like, just put it out there and... Pew, pew. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I think Priest is a little, I don't know, like maybe this is just me being salty and bitter about my Priest, like continuously my Priest record, but there's got to be something. Like I need someone, because I know there are people out there who like have like seven and a half wins with Priest and like six and a half wins with all the other classes. Like I need to sit down with one of them and have them teach me what they're doing with Priest. Yeah. Because uh, okay. this has been way too long <laughs> and Priest has been one of my worst classes for way too long. Um, there's got to be something I'm missing there. But yeah, I mean, it's just sometimes you feel like, and that again goes to like what classes are better, right? Like the more in control you are, especially in the beginning, the the more your skill is going to be able to affect the outcome of the game. And some classes just don't have very complicated ways of doing that by design, of course, but it makes mm-hmm. them uh, like, I, I don't know, maybe it's just the way that we play. Yeah, I have to uh, keep it knows? about hate, hate the game, not the player, of course. It's uh, yeah. people, yeah, I have to say that as well sometimes when that guy flame strikes me for the third time like oh yeah oh well like just <laughs> no. wants to win so he picks a good card all right cool yeah um shady i want to bring the point back to uh this coaching thing because i have a hypothesis i want to know your perspective on it mm-hmm. um because we talked about kind of your rapid climb into an infinite player and how you basically reach infinite in a month i think my my guess is that coaching has helped you improve at a much faster rate than a player who just plays by themselves um do you, do you agree with that? How do you think coaching has helped you out with that? Coaching has helped me out a ton because uh, I wasn't in control of the cards themselves. Obviously, everything's voice controlled, so everything gets slowed down artificially, like it's mm-hmm. it's automatic. 
-hmm. So that has led to those those great habits that are in place where I'm like asking the um, student, okay, what are you doing here? And by always asking that question, you start asking yourself that question every time. All right, what are we doing here? It's just it just becomes a habit. Like, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Uh, what happens if he has this? What happens if he has that? You just ask them questions as well. And that dialogue really helps you as well, because uh, I think it's easier to ask those questions, obviously, when you're conversing. Um, although now I, I notice that the results go, are going up a little bit when I'm not coaching, which is obviously because you have to devote less brain power to like, all right, put the fairy dragon in the middle. Oh, no, wait. Uh, <laughs> first, we uh, draw the card. You need to coach and... me, Shady. That's, <laughs> okay. that's something I consistently struggle right. with. Right, the positioning, which helps, you know, when you're like, yeah. all right, that, that's I also have that every time something goes on the board, I'm like, OK, where does this go? This mm. is so huge in Shaman. Every card that I place in Shaman is like, all right, where is this going to go when I get a flame flame? That's right why there. I suck okay. with Shaman, too. <laughs> I figured it out. So the probably the biggest, uh, the two biggest disparities, like when I look, compare my record to Shady's, is Shaman and Druid. Um, like I, I think it's it's kind of like amazing the different gaps because I don't consider myself like a bad Druid or a bad Shaman player. Uh, maybe I do consider myself a bad Shaman player, um, <laughs> but uh, just the difference. It's like you, you see what you can do with the class, right? Like that's what's possible. And I'm so far. I'm like two wins per run away from that. Like we compare stats, and it's like, oh yeah, I have like a you know significant edge on like my top classes like you know rogue warlock mage all those classes and that's a majority of the classes but the at my average is significantly lower than yours because the gap between the druid and the shaman is just so and we're both crap at you know priest and warrior for good reasons <laughs> um but the gap for shaman and druid is so overwhelmingly big and i think part of it with shaman though now that you just said that is the positioning I'm like notoriously bad at positioning and I don't think about it as much as I should and I forget about it. But, uh, and I don't see, like it's such a subtle effect, right? You don't necessarily always realize, oh, that screwed me over. Or maybe like just, oh, I've given away information about my hand to my opponent, like that I don't have a flame tongue or whatever. But, uh, but it is something that I think I'm going to need to watch out for as well as the whole like playing the class more aggro thing. Yeah, with Shaman, uh, the difference between that that Rage or, or that Worgen Infiltrator being in the right position to one shot the Evil Heckler when the Flame Tongue comes down, or you having to ram two minions in, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's huge. It's very significant. Yeah. It's probably the class that punishes you the most mm -hmm. when something's not in the proper spot. Yep. Because the, yep. uh, the Flame Tongue train gets interrupted. Like, you put something in the middle of your totems, my brain goes like, oh, no, those guys need to pass the buff on, and <laughs> now they can't. And yeah. All right, so cool. Yeah. All right, uh, should we move on to deep fried meta, or you got any? I think we should move on. Let's let's right. go on to deep fried meta, uh, and this is going to just be a continuation of our conversation. But in deep fried meta, uh, we we deep fry the meta, and because we have Shady Bunny on, if you haven't gotten this uh, this idea from from our little chat before this, Shady <laughs> Bunny is uh, his preference is aggro. His preference is always aggro. And the last person we talked to was Simcopter, whose preference in TGT was that, like, Simcopter made a huge improvement in TGT. And he said because he figured out the infinite card advantage game before everyone else did with TGT, uh, you know, in the arena. And so he was playing that style, and it got a lot, like, a very good result for him. Well, now we're going the opposite direction. This is how great Hearthstone Arena is, right? Like, you're just talking to great players, and they do everything. Um, so Shady Bunny has always, not just in TGT, but he's always been uh, more in favor of aggro, um, you know, to like slightly faster mid-range or just generally mid-range, but not a control player. Uh, and it's been like, you know, we talk about his record now. It's not like he just got this record in TGT. Uh, I don't know what your record was in BRM or GVG, but it's always been like very high. I think um, I clocked off at 7.4. So, so 7.4 in the GVG. Uh, but that uh -huh. was over the entire of GBG, so that was still the learning curve in there as well. So yeah, so average 7.5.4 wins per run, including the first game you've ever played of Arena. Uh, that's pretty good. No, not, no. <laughs> the first game ever was uh, when the open beta, right? So I, those obviously weren't in there. So for the, okay, from okay. GBG, yeah, yeah, they were from GBG yeah. onwards. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in in BRM, it seems like, especially the way that you play, um, like uh, Druid and Shaman, which 
most people, I think, play a little more conservatively. Uh, even like mid-range players like myself play like Shaman and Druid as slightly more uh, control class. Well, I play Druid as slightly more tempo class, but most people play it as slightly more control classes. Um, mm-hmm. And aggro is working in GBG. It is working very well in GBG. So tell us a little bit more about how GBG changed the meta to make aggro better, or is it just kind of the same? Uh, TGT, right? Or uh, TGT, it, right? Yeah, sorry. okay. So TGT. Um, something that's really big uh, are the Inspire cards. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I see a lot of people who go like, "Well, Mukla's champion is just ridiculously bad in Rogue because you don't really want to read Dagger every turn." I'm like, <clears throat> I don't care if I have to read Dagger <laughs> if everything gets plus one plus one. I mean, I don't yeah. have mana anyway if I'm playing. Uh, sorry, I don't have cards to spend my mana on anyway. In, in GVG. So I'm going to, uh, sorry, in, in TGT if I'm playing aggro. So I'm going to hit that hero power, but regardless. So the fact that you have those inspire engines to reward your early aggression on the board and just say, all right, you sacrifice some card advantage, that's fine. But you have a really strong hold on the board, so your opponent can't like get rid of that, uh, that Kodo Rider that you just played or that Mukla that you just played. You just win all of a sudden. You know, your opponent's like, all right, cool. I can do it. Two more cards in his hand. He's like, oh, no, he played a Mukla's champion. Oh, though, I have no wrath. Okay, he wins. That's, that's that feeling that you have. Like, spot removal has become a bit more rare. So those, those Inspire engines really reward those early aggressions. And then just, you know, other, other additions, like, like for Druid, for instance, Living Roots early game uh, uh, boost. Uh, for Rogue, you have the Buccaneer, which I think is great. Another source of just... Uh, mm-hmm. value that you can keep getting from keeping that minion alive uh, and yeah there's there's tons of other uh, cards that do a similar job that just really reward that early board control yeah so we're, we've been talking about these cards that kind of push aggro and allow you to become aggro what about the flip side do you think that um because of the dilution of uh, AOE removals that it just strengthens this kind of aggro archetype um, because you are seeing less of these flame strikes and consecrations. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. The uh, the amount of like, I always say this like I'm probably the player that says the most like the amount of times that I say, uh, all right, if you guys got a blizzard or a lightning storm, we lose. I'll, I'll flat out. I like mm-hmm. I like my play yeah. style is bold. Yep. And people in chat constantly say like, but what if he had MCT? What if I, I also get MCT the most out of everyone? Just ask. I, was, I got MCT five <laughs> times yesterday. Just five times in one stream. It was crazy. Um, because I simply say like, all right, statistically, mm-hmm. you don't have the card. You're not going to have the card. So make them have it. That's a statement that I say all the time. Like, make them have it. Don't. Uh, like, don't give a minion taunt by clearing it. Like, make them have the, the buff. Make them have the AoE. Make them have this. And when they have it, okay, don't be a baby about it. Just accept it. You, you took a risk and you lost. Don't go and question your strategy. Be like, oh, I should have done this. No. Mm-hmm. Statistically, it was the right play. Like, let's say seven out of ten times that play is going to work. Let's do the play, right? So yep. it's just seven about out of being... ten with like MCT and Lightning Storm, whatever. It's way higher than seven out of ten. <laughs> I, I think you're you're shortchanging the strategy because yeah, I yeah, do the of, same of, thing now in TGT. Course, but yeah, just giving a uh, very simplified yeah. uh, example, of course. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. With MCT and Lightning Storm, mm-hmm. you're much, much, much less likely to see those. So yeah, just people have way less AOE, so don't respect it. And yeah, if you get hit by it, yeah, it's fine. Move on, next game. Mm-hmm. Even if you get hit by it three times in a row, don't change your play style just because you got unlucky. Oh. Yeah, and I th- we talked about this a little bit on Thursday as well, but um, I-, I think a lot of people have the misconception that aggro is just, you know, you go face, you smork, and it takes no skill. And if you look at some constructed decks, um, I- it's still not true, but it's closer to mm. that statement. It's closer, and, much yeah, closer. Closer, um, but in arena, that is so not true. Um, aggro, especially pure aggro decks, are so punishing just because you can't go face every single turn. You do have to make some small trades in the beginning to set up mm-hmm. that kind of mid-game push. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if you make a mistake with aggro decks in the arena, that one small mistake, it's over. You, you suddenly sacrifice the two damage that you need to get lethal, and before they can stabilize, you just 
um, don't have enough cards to make up for that mistake either. And uh, I think it's such a powerful archetype that requires so much skill. And that's that's kind of what you want to see in the arena, right? Like these punishing decks that require a lot of skills to pilot. And at the same time, if you make a mistake, it just sinks you. Yeah, because one of the misconceptions is not that, like, what do you mean by aggro in the arena, right? You just mean generally yeah. more aggro than the average deck. That means every game you go in, you don't know if you're the aggro deck. Yeah, you're not. This is not constructed. You don't just go in and be like, oh, I'm a hunter. That is a paladin that's running, like, a lay on hands and a bunch of big taunts, like, you know, whatever. You go in and you're like, oh, I'm a hunter. I'm running an aggro deck. I'm facing a paladin. I don't know what the paladin has. And, and just based <laughs> on your draw, you can be promoted or devoted as as you want to see it to the control player yeah right it's the um mm -hmm. like i had this hunter deck that played uh i think like i think uh let, let's say if we had 12 wins then 11 of those wins i was an aggro player and then one win i was like wow this guy just wow <laughs> this guy like <laughs> went out blessing of might early on i was like whoa 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 slow down man i can't yeah. keep up so and then suddenly <laughs> i have three cards more than him i'm like well uh, not very used to doing this, but sure, okay, I'll, I'll do control. Because like, yeah. usually you don't win with, with aggro if you do try to assume that control position. I think that's what mm -hmm. you mean with uh, saying it's so difficult, is that if you do have, I think most people when they play Hearthstone, and they were talking about just you know, general arena player, has one gear, right? They have one mm -hmm. play style that works well for Mage and Paladin. You know, if we're just generalizing right now so straight up try to get more cards than the other guy just very general style and throw them in an aggro deck was like well i mean you could play that cult master on turn four and draw two or maybe even three cards but yeah. what you had to do is play that yeti because now your cult master is gonna die to an arcane shot and he's gonna grab the board and I don't care if you just drew three cards. If you don't have the board as an aggro deck, you're going to lose. Because Mr. I, uh, sorry, Archangel yeah. is maybe a bad example. Let's say Holy Smite. Mr. Anduin over there is not gonna <laughs> is not gonna like let you take the board back. He's just gonna mm -hmm. have you're not gonna outvalue him either because he's just gonna heal his stuff and you know, yeah. So it's about knowing how do I win? How yeah. does this deck win? And most people just have like, oh, well, if you play Hearthstone, you win by doing this thing. It's like, no, mm -hmm. this particular deck wins in this way. This particular deck wins in that way. So, yeah, pretty important yep. skill. Mm -hmm. And it changes every game depending on what your uh, your opponent does. What, what yeah. I think people do a lot that's like kind of just flat out wrong in aggro decks is they they when they're put in a bad position, right? Because when you're put in a bad position as an aggro deck in the beginning, you're most likely not going to win. Um, yeah. But... There's a difference between giving yourself a 10% chance to win and giving yourself a 30-40% chance to win. And sometimes, even if you're the aggro deck, you have to start setting up that like turn 5 play where you flood the board with 6 things, you know, like totally take your opponent by surprise and then do something with that with like a Mooklas or like a Sorma Champion or, you know, just a Cult Master even to try to give yourself a win condition. Um, and instead of taking all of those minions and having played them like on curve to play other minions on curve instead or to use some removals to set it up so that you can do some kind of board flip turn um which when you talk about a board flip turn unless you're the rogue rogues do like a turn three four five board flip turns like fairly often that's yeah. just part of their play style even when yeah. they're quote-unquote aggro <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. uh because of the combos and stuff but even with other classes like sometimes you look at your opponent they drop a zombie chow you either don't have a two drop or you have a two drop but they also have a two drop you realize you have to do something to win and the something is not to just stand there and withstand their attack because you're an aggro deck and you will run out of cards before your opponent. So that something has to be find the point in which I can actually become aggro, where I can flip the board to become aggro. And then you have to like figure out like the right percentage of how to go face to kind of finish the game off. And that's that's like you just hear me describe this, right? That's a really hard thing to do. Yep. That's stuff that people are not thinking about. And that's why, like, aggro is a very difficult playstyle to play correctly to get those high win rates. Because it's not something that you do, like, once in a blue moon. Like, to get to 12 wins, you're doing that at least once or twice in a run. So, uh, a point that Merps said earlier uh, is, is perfectly right. It's that point where you say any point where you could have traded or could have gone face may seem critical 
five, six turns later when mm -hmm. the guy either has yeah. three health or zero health because that Bloodwind Raptor didn't go phase. Yeah. So uh, it's those things where very, very punishing, whereas a control deck usually has like, well, as long as I outcard him, I'll be fine whether I'm going to win by having five cards on him or three cards <laughs> on him. That probably doesn't matter that much. Of yeah. course, they have to be careful that they don't take too much damage because, you know, mm -hmm. they might say, oh, man, if I didn't take that three damage, I wouldn't be dead right now. Uh, so very punishing. Uh, and what you said, Adwokta, about using your removal, that's what's so different in aggro as well. As, uh, I'm going to give a stupid example. I recently deadly shot at a Worgen Infiltrator, and it was the right play because he was going to oh, take yeah. the boards, right? Uh, you know, oh, I had a 3-2, yeah. but people will not do it. They'll be like, uh -huh. no, no. Uh, they're like very precious. Wait, was it with, with you? We naturalized the zombie him. chow. Yeah. I think it was with zombie you, Shady. Chow. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, of course. We all agreed that naturalizing the zombie chow was the only We all saw it immediately. That yeah, was right. Like, of course, this is uh, the best play. The, yeah. the it was like a two second decision. Uh, yeah, it was like, oh, yeah, of course, I have to go. Three infinite uh, players sit to together. Mm -hmm. that, naturalize that zombie chow. That's the way to win. We had that, yeah, we had that fell reverse as well. That was crazy. Yeah. But if you use that removal, then your minions can go face. Whereas a lot of people are like, wait, mm -hmm. I can't use my minions to kill that and save my removal. People have this, yeah. like, this, this feeling of like, if I can use minions, I shouldn't use removal. Whereas in an aggro deck, you are completely mm -hmm. doing that the other way around. Every time you can use the removal, use the removal and allow the minion to go face. Yep. Keep the minion safe, let him do the face damage and use the removal very liberally. That's how yep. you, know, you use the removal in an aggro deck. Yeah, because if you're playing slower, that Blood from Raptor hitting his face two more times before it dies is not going to matter that much. But if you're playing aggro, that is a that's six points of damage. That's Fireball. huge. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. All right. Yeah. Um. I, I think another point I want to make about this is just, um. Not only do you, I, I think when we talk about aggro, you can divide it into the aggro classes, which you can say is kind of hunter, definitely. And uh, Rogue, I, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. it is, you can also make it pretty aggressive. Paladin, at the same time, you can make it annoyingly aggressive. Um, but aggro, you can make basically any deck. You know, you can go aggro priest in the arena as well. It's For sure. a lot of times it's about uh, tempo, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Aggro is necessarily tied in with tempo. And hero powering, basically at any point between like turn one and turn five i want to say that is significant anti-tempo and kind of exactly what you don't want for an aggro now priest will not have the the reach and that la that last second um th not last second like you know the the last damage that you need but at the same mm -hmm. time you can go aggro priest and be pretty successful if you have the good draft for it yep yeah you need to like buff your stuff and yeah. you need some mid-range minions in that deck to heal when yeah, you have just like, like mana left yeah. over it's like with everything, you're just less likely to get it, right? Mm -hmm. That's why yes. counter is better because kill commands a class card and having five reach is pretty good for three mm -hmm. mana. Whereas uh, as a priest, you know, you can have this wonky aggro deck where you do have double spawn of shadows and, you know, like shadow palmer or whatever, but you're just way less likely to get that kind of deck with some reach than when you're doing a hunter draft. Yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, let's let's move on. And uh, we have a, a question from the goat, I think, Murps. Yes, we do. I'm very proud of this question. Um, uh, okay, so Shady, uh, I'll ask you this question. I'm going to answer it first myself to give you guys some time to think about it. But the question for this week is, what Hearthstone specific superpower would you like to have? You can only choose one. Now, I'll give you some examples. For example, one Hearthstone-related superpower would be you always get to see your opponent's hand. Another one could be, you know, you could say, uh, for every single draft, I, I want, uh, like, one Chow, two Piloted Shredders, and, and one Norsey Kraken, and I'm always guaranteed those cards. Um, and, so, and so no one else has a, a secret, like, superpower? No, just no, you? No, just you. So you get this advantage. Everyone else goes off on their... Um, normal ways, and no one knows that you have the superpower as well. Uh, now, mine would obviously be being able to control every single RNG element <laughs> in the game. It doesn't. No, 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 sorry, it, it doesn't even have to be like me drawing cards. Whenever I want to control the bombers, I want to control <laughs> the. Uh, I want to because you want the... people to quit Hearthstone. <laughs> yes, exactly. See. Mm -hmm. Here's the way I think about it. The superpower that you choose at the end, number one, it has to be 
be actually good and it has to help you win because otherwise why would you do it but second of all it has to be infuriating for the other player you have to just win in style right like they are down to six health and they have seven things on the board matter bomber boom perfect <laughs> <laughs> you, you, thought, yeah. you yeah. win and you get the trolled in moment how great is that anyways guys what uh what about you uh all right um i i I'd be okay with a fairly simple one. People never draw their AoE against me, right? No MCP, <laughs> no, no Blizzard, no Consecration. This right. is the if bottom just, of the deck. Right. If I just know that the AoE is never coming out, then yeah, all right, that's all I need. And, uh, we're going to get a lot more 12 frames. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Hmm. Uh, superpower. I don't like superpowers. I was never into like the kind of thing where you have an advantage over your opponent. If I had a superpower, I guess I would want to be able to continue streaming without ever being sniped. That that would be the superpower that I want. Uh, just the just the mental safety net where I know that I cannot possibly get sniped either my deck or my whatever, so that whoever's watching just has no idea they're facing me. Um, or, or anyone, and so I'll just be like a normal, normal arena player. Wow. Um, that, that would make me feel a lot better. Okay, so we've established that out of the three of us, I'm definitely the most <laughs> evil one. Because Shady, all, all you want to do is just say, like, I want to play, and I just don't want to get super punished yeah. by this. I'm a simple man. I just don't want my stuff to blow up. That's fine. <laughs> right. Abokta, you're by far the most honorable out of all of us. You're basically saying, like, look, I just want to play this in the most fair way possible. I just want to enjoy this game. And for me, I say, I want this unfair advantage, and I want to make people uninstall the game and break their computers. Yes. So, um... We've learned something about all three of us today, and uh, I, I, I appreciate this. This is good. I'll take this to the therapist with me next time. Uh, that's what the goat's for, to make you realize things about yourself uh, <laughs> that you would not have known. Uh, so um, once again, uh, after question from the goat, thank you to all of our Patreons um, who donated on uh, patreon.com slash grinning goat to help feed the goat. We've had a very successful uh, couple months, and we'll be making a video next week, um, you know, giving you an update about the status of the goat and what's happening and uh, what our what our plans are uh, and what we're doing with with uh, with all this grass. Um, but yeah, uh, so thank you everybody who contributed, and if you want to support us, um, you know, feed the goat. Uh, if you're feeling a little, a little guilty about using ad block on our content, feed the goat, uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll. I guess we have a yeah. We're we're going to get so the go uh, Patreon collects the money at the end of the month. So we're getting our our next paycheck and tip jar basically uh, at the end of October. So we're really looking forward to that. And just thank you guys. None of this would be possible without your contribution. Um, just, it really helps keeps us going. Um, thank you. And Merbs needs a new computer, so that's okay, happening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let's move on to card good bad. Card good bad is where we say whether a card is good or bad, and we always let our guests pick card good bad because there's usually some kind of pet card that uh, everybody has and they want to talk about, and they think they have a, a different perspective on it than other people. And I love this one. Uh, so Shady Bunny, you have chosen uh, Bloodlust, and I am adding Savage Roar on there because that's Druid. You're good with Druid. Yeah. It's Bloodlust. You're good with uh, Shaman. And you play this aggro style that seems to really fit in with these cards. Uh, I'll come off and say right now that we rate those like very average kind of cards. They're if 50 ranked on uh, on the tier list uh, you know or maybe even lower or like a little bit higher um but it's around that like bloodfed raptor level and uh um so you brought this up and i'm guessing you're going to say that they're good yeah they're really really good but it's tricky because they're also really really bad uh because they're <laughs> they they do one thing really well all the rest is kind of eh, right mm. they're really good at letting your board advantage that you built up throughout the entire game translate into a win. Uh, so many times you have this as a shaman where you're like, I have these three totems, these two one ones. I just can't get there. My opponent's going to get the board back. He's going to kill all those beautiful little totems one by one. <laughs> and I'm going to lose. And I'm like, oh, bloodless 15 to the face. Nice game, right? So it's, <laughs> it's that feeling. It's that, that role that the blood first uh, fulfills. Um, I, I'm going to be honest. Months ago, 
I rated the guard fairly lowly as well because it was, ah, it's just a win more card, right? That's mm -hmm. what people say. It's just a win more card. And they couldn't be more wrong. It's just the last piece of the puzzle that you need mm -hmm. to close out the game. Mm -hmm. uh, Im imagine that you are playing Freeze Mage and you have no Alex in your deck, right? <laughs> it's it's kind of that thing. It's like, right. I need it at the end of the game to win the game. So it, it's, of course, I have many Shaman decks that don't have it and, you know, they, they do well themselves. But uh, the point is that it rewards you so much for that aggressive style that I promote. Like, don't be too worried about card advantage. Make sure you have the board. Once you start running out of cards, you totem up a little bit more. You know, you have that board advantage and then boom, 15 to the face and you win. And so, so how often yeah. do you use it to trade as opposed to going to the face? when i'm losing um with uh with <laughs> savage yeah um, <laughs> when when you're losing uh so when uh with savage shore it's a bit more flexible so bloodlust mm -hmm. is really the 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 cherry on the cake it's the finisher but uh savage shore it's actually fairly useful sometimes turn three even for like all right at an awkward draw my opponent has a three two i guess i'll roar i'll use my face to clear it bloodlust you can't really do it so savage mm -hmm. shore is a lot more flexible obviously a lot less rewarding than bloodlust when you do have that full board because bloodlust does add more damage uh savage Shore is still very very good at doing the job though closing out the game uh but bloodlust the, the card the reason why i picked it in instead of uh savage Shore is that it's it's just that one thing that it does extremely well it's that finisher once you have that board and it's that period of a couple turns where you have this opportunity to do it and after that period, your opponent grabs the board back, the stones yeah. are gone, and mm -hmm. it's gone. The window has closed. So it's that, it's that little window where you say, I win the game now if I have a Bloodlust. And that's why I like to have one Bloodlust in the deck to you know, either draw it early and, and save it, hopefully just top deck it when I need it. Um, it's, it's usually never really a bad card in the end game. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. And so do you use Savage Roar the same exact way? Is it different? Is it just because the two classes are different uh, that you use it differently? Or can you make uh, it, set it up exactly the same? With, with the Savage Roar, it happens more often that you are just going to be like, all right, so I'm not necessarily losing. You're obviously not crushing it too hard if you're using a Savage Roar to trade, because then you'd rather be like, all right, I'll just use the Savage Roar next turn and just kill him. Mm -hmm. But if you use the Savage Roar to trade, you don't necessarily have to be in a na nasty spot. With Bloodlust, you're usually in a bad spot if you use that to trade. Uh, but with Savage Roar, it'd be like, okay, because it gives you a phase damage, that's a huge difference. It gives you a phase damage. So suddenly you have like this uh, weapon equipped. If you're going to hero power, it's a Wrath. So it's like, all right, I'll Wrath that guy. Uh, then my uh, my Bomber is a 3-2. Two, two. It suddenly becomes 5-2. That one can kill the Belcher. Okay, it's fine. And, you know, you just kind of keep your position on the board. Just like, all right, he played some big minions. I can reward myself for building up the boards of small millions and then kind of make his card quality not count for a turn. It's like, okay, you have better cards than me, but now they're suddenly all plus two damage. And so that no longer, that no longer really counts. Uh, so it's used for that sometimes, but yeah, most of the time you just hope to kind of charge out a Druid of the Saber, slap on a Savage Roar as well, and just boom, just a bunch of damage. Yeah, something I've definitely noticed with Blood and Lust and Savage Roar. So the thought process that you go through every single turn, like let's take Paladin as an example. You want to say, um, what can I do to play around Consecration? What can I do to play around Blessing of Kings, True Silver? And a lot of times there's a, a very set thing that you can do against those specific cards. With Blood and Lust and Savage Roar, I mean, it just comes down to, can I remove all of his or her minions? And that's kind of something you want to do anyway. So it's, it's something that you can't really play around just just by doing mm -hmm. some like one very easy move on your end so uh, i th i think it goes back to your strategy of you know getting on the board making it difficult for your opponent and with bloodless and savage roar unless they remove all of your minions which is something that they want to do anyways um there's nothing that they can do extra or, or you know something other than what they already want to do to kind of stop you from winning the game yeah exactly yeah. and if you did everything correct in the early game as an aggressive player, unless they have AoE, a <laughs> recurring team, you win. Because mm. the board mm. is yours. Yeah. They play something, unless it has charge, it's not killing your small guys. You just use the board that you already have or 
some removal and keep keep that board healthy and close the game out. Um, so I guess this is kind of a little going back uh, and kind of off the topic of Bloodlust and Savage Roar, but you mentioned that you have all these totems to, to Bloodlust. I think one of my problems is I never feel like I have all these totems to Bloodlust. Mm. So let's say you have a situation, just in a hypothetical, uh, it's turn six, you have some cards in your hands, you can play three two drops, or you can play two two drops and a totem, and then save one of the two drops to play on a later turn with another totem, and you're like fighting for a, a board that's kind of even. Like, you know, your opponent's not, you're not like totally off the board, uh, mm -hmm. your opponent doesn't totally have the board, but it's also like, it's not like you're dropping this onto a totally clean board either. Like both you and your opponent have some kind of like board. Yeah, it's it's uh, it goes once again to having that knowledge and experience. Like, mm -hmm. Do I need this Gilblin Stalker? Do I really need him? Or can I afford to like, take one turn of a totem? And with a Shaman, especially with an aggro Shaman, you're going to run out of stuff to play at some point. Yeah. So it's, it's about... Uh, I used to be like super, super tempo-oriented, and I'd be like, no, of mm -hmm. course we play the two-drop uh, extra stats. But now I've, I've grown more to the style where I'm like, can I squeeze out a totem here? Mm, Am I going to lose okay. board all of a sudden because of that? If the answer is no, I'll squeeze out the totem because otherwise you'll just end up toteming with five mana left rather than just weaving in that totem from time to right. time. So, and a shaman does a great job at that now with the totem golem early, you know, overstat it, helps you grab the board. You'll have a two drop on turn three, but it usually doesn't matter if you have a spider tank on turn two. Mm -hmm. uh, Fire Guard Destroyer, also very good for its turn. So, it's usually pretty easy to grab that board and then like kind of take a slower turn with a totem weaved in between and then you know use a flame tongue to cash in those totems so the, the tempo does return back to you it's kind of an investment that you make you make mm -hmm. extra totems and then that flame tongue i, I love flame mm -hmm. tongue you know, it's a great card it allows you to get those uh, that tempo back by using the totems as damage plus get you know a little bit of card advantage or keep your keep yourself from running out of steam because obviously if you are sacrificing a river croc or you're sacrificing a healing totem it's a huge difference in terms of how much steam you're going to be left with uh, yeah, yeah. a couple games a uh, couple okay, turns into the game all right uh, I think that was a pretty good coverage on Bloodlust Savage Roar. I'll have to give those cards uh, a little more of a chance because I still I've been like kind of going away from that, but I'm going to try to play those two classes a little more aggro, and uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. Uh, but now we're moving on to because you guys know uh, we we do a run after every Light Forge and. It's the arena coupe. We don't get to pick the class. It's determined by some algorithm because we like algorithms. Uh, and right now, <laughs> we are about to do a priest run, which we're all not excited about at all. No. Nope. Um, because it is priest. And uh, let's talk a little about the priest before we do the run. Um, and, and it's just me and Merbs doing the run uh, because we, <laughs> we kick out guests so we can keep this as our record and we don't get influenced by uh, by other people. But, I mean, I know, Shady, you don't like Priest either. So we can just all pile on and how much we don't <laughs> like the Priest right now in TGT. Uh, um, uh, so, Murps, so... why don't you start with uh, with why we don't like the Priest? Because I, I just want to get it out of the way that none of us like the Priest. The Priest suffers from part of the problem that... Um very early paladins had now if you guys remember very early on like in classic uh, classic and in nax and everything like paladin was not the the you know the world beater that a lot of people think it is now and partly because of the reason that you know they didn't have shield and mini they didn't have mustard they didn't have ways to grab the board and if you think about paladins and priests both of them require the board and they don't have many very like great comeback mechanisms that that's not clunky right like consecration is a little bit clunky holy nova is a little bit clunky and while paladin has gotten the tools to grab the board on turn two and turn three priest they have these power cards on these turns um you know they have uh shrink meister if you have a one drop they have dark cultists they have valence chosen but they still haven't had that board stickiness that paladins had and so while we've seen paladins get this power jump from uh you know all the way back to now we still haven't seen it with the priest and i think that is still the main thing holding the priest back because if you think about it late game their hero power is ridiculous they have very premium cards you can just take a look at our tier list and you can see that a lot of their cards are top tier 
Shadow Word Pain, Shadow Word Death, all the minions. Uh, if you are able to hit with a Dark Cultist, that's fantastic. If you're able to hit with a Temple Enforcer, that's usually game winning. But the problem is just grabbing that game early. And with Priests, a lot of times you feel as if that's just not in your control. Like whenever I'm a Priest and I face a Rogue, I'm thinking, well, I'm never going to grab the board. Um, the Rogue is just going to always make sure that I don't get to stick on there. And then whenever I and behind i drop one big fatty they'll just sap and i think all of these problems kind of contribute to just why priest is not that strong right now cool <laughs> i mean i i i feel like i can't uh, there's not much to add to that from uh from you know, where i am it's uh it's a very complete picture of why uh of why the priest is uh is where where it is uh right now yeah um so is... shady, I, I see that um, <laughs> priest is one of the classes that uh, you don't do as well in, and also you uh, mm -hmm. don't play it as often. Is yeah. it mostly just because of the like you don't have fun with it, or is it just because of the weakness of the class? Uh, priest and I didn't start off well in TGT. Uh, I had very bad runs. That record you see is after two consecutive twelves. So wow. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> wow. Let's just say we had our differences. I was like, all right, face. was like, nah, I don't do well to go with it. So no, uh, what you said is right. Uh, with Priest, once again, uh, like Subtle, a friend of mine, a fellow streamer, as is saying, like, the best deck is a Priest deck, right? A Priest deck that mm. works is the best mm -hmm. deck, right? If you play against a Priest deck that works, you feel powerless. You're like, what can I do? I can't do anything. He's got mm. he's got Gilblin Stalker into Valence Chosen. I'm I'm done, right? I can't do anything. But sadly we don't always get a pre stick like that. And with like don't always, I, I mean most of the time we don't get a pre stick like that. And as you said, there are these classes with the early game control now. Paladin has shielded mini boss, rogue has backstab, right? It's it's so more often than not that you will not have initiative as a priest and as you said if you don't have initiative if your temple enforcer is not hitting anything your dark cultist is not hitting anything your shrink meisters their battle cry aren't doing anything you don't have anything to balance so there's there's so many things that don't quite work if you don't have initiative as the priest um yeah i, I think just at the moment the, where the class is it's like so demoralizing to play against when they're in control and so demoralizing to play when you don't have control as a priest so it's just yeah. like it's yeah. full on or it's nothing with the priest mm -hmm. so, which is which is indeed what it shows in my record i think i've had a, a one and three uh a three and three and then a 12 zero and then a 12 and two and then the 12 zero i had triple shrink meister double valence and you know as, as yeah. an early aggressive player it's just like all right uh -huh. Coin at my two, they play their two, I shrink their two, I kill it, they play their Who three. Who needs I paladins? This is even two. better. <laughs> right, yeah, then you feel like, all right, I got him. And and yeah, mm -hmm. as you said, like, you don't get 12-0 very often with a priest stick mm -hmm. that works. It's just like, all right, I mean, once I have the board, you're not getting back on. Sorry, buddy. So yeah, it's uh, it's not in a very fun class right now. It's it's all or nothing. It's, it's not very fun to play them. No. Yeah. I think when you look back at our 12 wins on Thursday, there were quite a few times where we roped on turn one with the coin and mm -hmm. it was just so many choices and it wasn't like you had one great choice. Yeah, and we were playing uh, Warlock and then Rogue for the record. If you're wondering yeah. why we're roping on turn one. We're not <laughs> playing the Priest. No, no, definitely not. But uh, because you brought up um, the lack of control you feel uh, as a Priest in the early game, with the rogue, it's exactly the opposite. And I see that as part of the problem. If you're a really uh, good player, if you're an infinite player, you want as many choices in the early game as possible. So if you're a rogue and you have drafted uh, early game and you have the coin, there's just so many options between daggering and waiting for an auto barber and, or backstab Defias. And with the priest in which it's kind of just like, well, I don't have that many moves. I'm definitely not using, or I don't want to use my hero power. And uh, with all of my minions, like Shrinkmeister is fine if you can get something out there beforehand, but that's not really guaranteed. And Vanglands, you need something to buff, and unless you stealth your two drop, a lot of times, you know, people know that turn three Vanglands is there, so they'll trade into it or they'll use a spell to remove it. And then it just takes away a lot of your early plays, which you need to get on the board. 
Yeah, like if you're pr uh, if you're a rogue, you punish people for doing things, right? They do something and then you punish them. That's just very direct. And when they do something, I mean, they put something on the board. It you know has one health, you have a hero power. It has two health, you have backstab. It has four health, you have uh, eviscerate. It has three health, you have uh, deadly poison. Or you know, it's just a whole bunch of things. You just punish your opponents for putting the minion on the board. As a priest, you don't punish anyone for putting a minion on the board. You punish uh, your opponent for either not being able to or choosing not to remove your minion when your minion is on the board. So when it comes to your opponent doing something that you can punish them for, now your opponent has to either be just so far behind or to be so stupid uh, in the early game for you to be able to punish them. And so people stop being, you stop seeing a lot of like really bad players pass like a couple of wins. Um, and then it, it, you start seeing a lot fewer uh, players who can't do things in the early game. Um, past a few wins also so you're just trapped in this area where decks are going to kill you because they're going to do the right thing and they're going to have the ability to control you unless you have what shady was talking about like that kind of ridiculous deck so you've changed your ability to punish your opponent from something that's very instant to something that takes more setup which means you you cede the control to your opponent um and on the bright side, if they do, and, and they inevitably will leave something on the board, that thing becomes really powerful. But if they're leaving something on the board, you're probably dead, which is why they're doing it. Yep. All Look right. All right. I think that uh, that wraps up our, our little powwow crapping on the priest. <laughs> and uh and we'll we'll end the uh, we'll end the podcast there druid's good um shaman's good all the other classes obviously good paladins and eh, priest really bad warrior still not a class yet but we have hope Fantastic um summary. <laughs> that's that's the summary for the last hour uh and we will be uh ending the podcast now thanks again to shady bunny uh for all of your time you've spent like what like six hours on our stream on thursday and now like another hour and a half here like thank you so much for taking your time out here and um uh you know we hope you, you had fun uh, we definitely have fun every time we play or talk to you yeah uh, I always say like it is uh, it's a privilege right you you never have to worry about asking me on I have a really good time and it's uh, it's always fun to share ideas with people that are thinking about uh, well the same topics all the time like all right is this card good or bad or you know, how is this going how do you approach this class so uh, it's very very fun to be here don't worry about it uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you're, uh, you, you've you had fun. We've definitely, this has been great, and we'll definitely do it again uh, at some point. Um, everybody, this is Shady Bunny. He has a Twitch and a YouTube, which is both slash Shady Bunny. Um, and go definitely check it out. And, you know, he still does coaching sessions, so if you if you hang out there, um, you know, you could get a, get a nice coaching session or watch someone else be coach, which could be very helpful uh, if you're, you know, in the mode where um, you're either at the basics or you want someone to explain to you and you can see other people make the mistake and get kind of corrected. And it's a very helpful uh, learning tool. Um, so um, I think that's, uh, that's it for me. Anything else you want to add, Murps? No, it's been a lot of fun, Shady. Thanks for coming on, and we'll uh, grab you and do a co-op again very soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. All right.